This lecture will cover two methods for analyzing ceramic thin sections, the point counting method and the descriptive system. The point counting method was borrowed from geology to generate a quantitative frequency distribution of different inclusion compositions and or grain size. In this sandstone example, a 2D grid is laid over the slide under the microscope, and at each point, the red dot on the slide, the analyst records the type of mineral beneath the red dot. Usually, a few hundred points are recorded per sample. At the end of the point count analysis, a frequency of each type of mineral is calculated. Those frequencies tell the analyst what type of sandstone the sample is, which provides information on things like how the rock was formed. In this case, the point count analysis revealed that the sample is a quartz aronite. The point count method in ceramic petrography borrows almost directly from geology. The method introduced by James Stoltman is the one most commonly used by archaeologists in the United States. The analyst records the relative proportions of sand, temper, if the temper is different from the naturally occurring sand, and matrix, which is the clay and the silt sized particles. The goal is to quantify the relationships between natural inclusions and those intentionally added by the potter and the fired clay matrix. The point count method works well when the pottery is composed of many different kinds of rocks and minerals. This slide shows a sand tempered middle woodland vessel from northern Georgia. The sand contains quartz, feldspar, amphiboles, quartzite, and granite. The percentages of these different rocks and minerals could be indicative of a specific provenance. Once the entire sample has been point counted, the analyst will compare the compositional data, the percent of each type of inclusion, and group the pottery. The different groups could indicate different provenance, different groups of potters, or both. A related approach is called the petrophases model, which works well in regions with sand deposits that can be differentiated on the landscape. Sand deposits in a defined region are classified into different petrophases on the basis of composition and spatial occurrence. The point counted ceramic data can then be matched to quantitative analysis of the sand. This analytical technique is very common in the American Southwest. The point count method doesn't work as well in regions with minimal geologic variability. Although Belize has major geologic differences, within each region, the bedrock is very similar, so point counting the inclusions in the pottery doesn't provide as much insight. For example, this thin section shows limestone temper in a clay that naturally contains limestone. If you were to point count this sherd, over 98% of the inclusions would be limestone. This slide is from a sherd excavated from the same site as the sherd in the previous slide. Both contain over 98% limestone. Does this mean that they were produced in the same way or in the same place? Although both sherds contain identical quantities of carbonate, but not matrix, they are clearly very different. 
Of course, an analyst conducting point count analysis would notice these differences. But since the point count method requires quantitative data to perform statistical analyses, there is nothing built into the method to systematically describe the differences in these two thin sections. The point count method is attractive to analysts because it provides quantitative data that can be analyzed using statistical analysis. However, it is not a one-size-fits-all approach and statistical analyses cannot fully capture the variability in human behavior. Moreover, it is not very useful in regions with a homogeneous geology. It can provide very important data particularly in the case of the petrophases approach used in the American Southwest, but it is not the best analytical technique for all situations. Although methods borrowed from geology are essential for describing rock and mineral inclusions, additional methods are required to address features arising from the technological processes of ceramic production. The descriptive system is a qualitative approach to the characterization of ceramic thin sections. It not only provides a systematic method for identifying rocks and minerals, it offers a way to evaluate the clay by using terminology and concepts borrowed from soil micromorphology. This technique provides greater sensitivity to technological properties by applying a comprehensive and systematic method of description to record all features and not just the rock and mineral inclusions. The first step in the descriptive system is to group similar thin sections together. For example, this slide groups all sherds that contain limestone into one group and all sherds that contain granite into a second group. There are clearly differences within each group, but the sherds within a group are more similar to one another than to sherds in the other group. Dividing the sherds into groups based on composition of the inclusions provides a starting point to understanding provenance. The analyst then further divides the larger groups if necessary. This approach allows for a consideration of variability within each group, which could be due to human behavior or to natural variations in the clays, for example. I know this slide is a bit busy, but I wanted to just point your attention to the fact that there are multiple different categories of data collected rather than just the composition of the rock and mineral inclusion. All analysts, regardless of the type of pottery they are analyzing or where in the world it was made, record the exact same data for each fabric group. Although you cannot perform statistics, the systematic descriptions allow for comparisons. Instead of point counting, the frequency of inclusions is estimated by comparing the thin section to the frequency charts, like the one shown in the upper left-hand corner of this slide. For each type of inclusion, both roundness and shape is recorded. The size of each inclusion is documented as a range and classified according to the Uden-Wentworth grain size scale. Analysts also use charts to discuss the sorting. These comparison charts help to standardize the data between analysts and are also used in soil micromorphology analysis. The primary advantage of this system is the adoption of descriptive terminology from soil micromorphology. This image shows different types of voids which is another attribute recorded in the descriptive system. I cannot go into every attribute, but I wanted to provide two examples of how analyzing the clay can provide important information on pottery production.
There are a few different ways to fire a ceramic vessel, and these different methods leave traces on the pottery. Some of the traces, like fire clouding on the exterior of vessels, are visible with the naked eye. Others can be identified under the microscope. This is an oversimplified dichotomy, but in general, vessels fired in an open fire were fired at a lower temperature than those in a kiln. Potters could also better control the temperature if they fired their ceramic vessels in a kiln. The optical activity of the micromass, or the clay, can provide clues about the firing temperature. When a slide on a microscope is rotated on the stage under cross-polarized light, the clay goes in and out of extinction and appears to sparkle, for lack of a better word, which means that there is birefringence. An optically inactive micromass does not exhibit any changes when the stage is rotated. Although it is more difficult to picture using these static images, the image on the left has an optically active clay, while the image on the right is optically inactive. The image on the right even looks kind of dull and dense in these static images. Firing changes the properties of the clay. We can determine from this data that the vessel on the left was fired at a lower temperature likely below 700 degrees Celsius, and the vessel on the right was fired at a higher temperature. Although we cannot determine the firing regime, we do have data on temperature that can help us to understand differences in pottery production practice. Different features in the soil can provide information on how and where the soil was formed, which can tell the analysts where potters may have been collecting clay on the landscape. The image on the left shows a soil feature with concentric circles. These circles form when a soil is seasonally inundated with water and there are distinctive wet and dry cycles. This pottery was produced using clay from a location in the foothills of a group of mountains composed only of limestone. The depression between the foothills and the mountains are seasonally inundated with water, so this is likely where potters were collecting clay to produce this type of pottery. This depression location is also where most of the clay accumulation in the region is. The soil micromorphology provided more specific information on provenance than could have been ascertained from the rock and mineral composition alone. Thin section petrography is a relatively inexpensive analytical technique that provides important information on how and where ceramic vessels were produced in the past. The best course of action is to select the analytical technique that is most appropriate for your ceramic sample and the one that is capable of answering your research questions. I use the descriptive system because my research focuses on how people share information with one another about the pottery production process. Whatever technique you use, petrography is a powerful tool. Once you have the background knowledge and the skills, you can analyze pottery from anywhere in the world.